You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. Hello and welcome back to the Inside China podcast for the second episode in the special series looking at how Hong Kong's experience of the pandemic was just a little different to how it played out elsewhere these past three years. My name is Holly Chick, speaking to you from the newsroom here at the South China Morning Post. And in this episode, you're going to hear about some of the people who took it upon themselves to use social media to help others. Elsewhere in the world, social media was struggling to regulate the tsunami of misinformation, conspiracy and racism that was described as an infodemic by the WHO. But here in Hong Kong, certain groups and certain people on Facebook and Twitter became known as trusted sources of information. There's one particular Facebook group which started out as a small online community aiming to support people stuck in quarantine isolation. It grew and grew to become an essential resource for anyone flying into or out of Hong Kong as well as journalists wanting to report the stories of people in quarantine hotels and quarantine facilities. This group highlighted the plight of this family, and us as journalists were able to highlight these rules and how they affected people. It also became home to one of the most heartwarming and life-affirming Facebook threads of the entire pandemic. My 84-year-old mom is returning home from uh, New York City alone to Hong Kong. Her name is Anna Gong, and she will be in a wheelchair sitting in the premium section. Is anyone else on that flight? Please help us take care of her until I pick her up from Asia World Expo, hopefully Sunday afternoon. The other is a story about a person who worked for quite some time under a pseudonym, but has now revealed themselves. He is a self-described stay-at-home dad who started live-tweeting the daily press conferences by the Hong Kong government and health officials. And he just kept on doing it. I'm probably a little uh, OCD on it, but I like to do it every single day. I've been doing it every day for 1,100 days in a row. Uh, it's just become a habit, I guess, and, and I, I'm happy to do it. I mean, it doesn't pay. I, some people have donated some money, but I'm happy to do it every day. So let me once again take you back to the year 2020. As people in cities across the world were asked to stay at home, the use of social media, particularly Facebook, boomed. And conspiracy theories, xenophobia and anti-fax misinformation blossomed. It took until April of that year for Facebook and WhatsApp to bring in specific measures to limit the spread of online hate, misinformation and conspiracy. But in March, a Facebook group was launched with the aim of helping people arriving or returning to Hong Kong who are required to do the 14 days of quarantine either at home or in other accommodation. It was called the Hong Kong Quarantine Support Group, In December of that year, the Hong Kong government introduced what it called the Designated Quarantine Hotel Scheme. And for the next two and a half years, the relationship status for people traveling to Hong Kong was said to complicate it. What should we do if the test result is positive? Can we self-isolate at home? If we can't, what's going to happen to our pets? Has anyone brought pets back into Hong Kong from Europe recently? Is it even possible since the hamster wave? Does anyone have experiences with flight cancellations due to flight bans? Given news on the extension of flight bans, is anyone planning to go for a washout period in another country? Did anyone else land and their QR codes stay blue and never change to amber? Can anyone explain to me how the Leave Home Safe app and Vaccine Pass works for children? I highly recommend the 181 Hotel. Their service and food is very good. They also prepared some gifts for our kids. If you're looking for a quality stay on a budget, 
I would definitely recommend Soka Sea View. My mom and I just completed our 21 days quarantine at Avolo Hotel. We enjoyed the food, staff are super responsive, and Wi-Fi is good. The most popular hashtags on the page give you an idea of what people were posting and searching for over the past years. Hashtag visas and entering Hong Kong. Hashtag quarantine facilities. Hashtag kids traveling with. And there's also things like hashtag quarantine art and hashtag feeling unwell. But this page really grew in popularity when the Hong Kong government opened a quarantine center with three and a half thousand beds, not far from the Hong Kong Disneyland. It's a location that is now somewhat infamous in Hong Kong. It's called Penny's Bay. In 2021, it was where you got sent for your first week of the 21-day quarantine if you were an American arriving in Hong Kong. In 2022, it was where many got sent if you reported mild symptoms of COVID, including members of the Hong Kong government and a political establishment who tested positive after attending a controversial banquet with 200 people. I, as a political leader, the one who is to do the right thing. This is the sound of Junius Ho, a pro-establishment hardline politician. One day after being sent to Penny's Bay. He live streamed on Facebook and criticized the quarantine order. Over on the Hong Kong Quarantine Support Group, the questions and comments reflected the reality for the rest of us who had to do the full 21 days of quarantine according to government rules. My husband tested positive on day three of our hotel quarantine and got transferred to Penny's Bay. Unfortunately, he doesn't have a towel and hasn't taken a bath in two days. Does anyone know who he can contact to get a towel? I would have thought this was a basic toiletry. I'd recommend that anyone entering Penny's Bay wishing to eat vegetarian food to bring some of their own snacks and noodles. Penny's Bay is not for the weak of heart. Definitely not for kids under 18. Not for people with serious health issues and those with mental issues like anxiety and depression. I'm just grateful we finally left that place, as it's very depressing there, especially with three kids, and one has serious food allergies and intolerances. Tips from a survivor of the Penny's Bay Quarantine Center: Pack well, make the best out of the worst, stay sane. No point complaining, 'cause it's not going to make anything better. Just chill. Now we've been in contact with the person who started the Hong Kong Quarantine Support Group, as well as one of the long-term admins for the page. They're very modest and don't want to go on the record, but they're happy for us to tell the story of this small group of volunteers who worked to maintain a crucial online support group for Hong Kong over the past three years. Laura Westbrook works on our city desk, and like many of the journalists in the city, is a member of what was once called the Hong Kong Quarantine Support Group on Facebook. Hello, Laura. Hello. People in Hong Kong had a very different experience of the pandemic via Facebook compared to the U.S., Canada, Australia, and the U.K. And it's all about this particular support group. Tell us how you found out about this group. Yeah, so I think the Hong Kong was very unique when it came to the pandemic, and what I mean by that was, let's go back in time, back in 2020. If we re- try and recall what the atmosphere was like back then, there was a lot of fear. People were still unsure about the virus. We didn't know, you know, there's no vaccine at that point. And I did a story about Hong Kongers kind of helping each other, such as donating food and masks to the needy. And I came across this、uh, Facebook group called the Hong Kong Quarantine Support Group. It was started by two women, and it was sort of an online forum to provide initially kind of support. And donations, a buddy for people who were in quarantine or undergoing isolation. And back in March 2020, it had 
2,000 members. There were about 70 volunteers who would deliver food to people who were quarantined. Now it's grown to 97,000. Back then, there was a desire by these two women to help other people. Like, what was quarantine like? What was it like to undergo isolation? And people would post about what it was like and, and to give people information. And also this group was providing donations and if they needed stuff while they were in there, giving that to them as well as kind of support. So it really started from that and, and then sort of grew into something else. So what kinds of people were posting there? So when I say it kind of grew into something else, it then grew into this sort of research center. It's hard to even go through how many changes Hong Kong went through during the pandemic. There were so many rules that would come into play, sometimes at really short notice. Hong Kong had 21 days quarantine, we had 14 days quarantine, we had seven days quarantine. There were rules where you could do home isolation with a bracelet if you tested positive. Then you were sent to a quarantine camp uh, and hotel quarantine for people who were traveling into Hong Kong. So there were so many things that happened, like sort of rapid fire. And this became a group to share information about what was happening, what was the experiences of people when things changed. And then when hotel quarantine got into place, it then sort of became like a review group of, you know, what were the good quarantine hotels? What were the bad ones? Like this hotel, the food was terrible. At this hotel, you know, it's great for children. You know, people who were traveling at that time and experiencing, you know, hotel quarantine and, and different hotel quarantine groups, they would share their experiences. And so for anyone who was even thinking about traveling or who had family members who were going to be coming into Hong Kong, it became like the go-to group of what to expect or, you know, what hotels to book. I myself, I did hotel quarantine once for seven days, thank God, all I could um, manage um, mentally. I can't even imagine people who actually did 21 days. But it was the first place I went to when I was looking for a hotel. There was a search function and, you you know, you have a search and I was looking at different people's reviews. It was so helpful. It also then kind of evolved into people creating different spreadsheets about, you know, at that time last year, if airlines carried a certain number of COVID positive passengers, they would get banned. And this caused huge amounts of disruption to people who were traveling because, you know, you'd book your flight, then uh, you get to the airport and then the previous flight, there would be people who tested positive the flight would get banned, you'd be stranded in, you know, whichever country. And uh, someone created a Google spreadsheet to track which flights were banned till when. At one time, Hong Kong was banning people from arriving from certain countries because of the COVID risks that those countries presented. So you had people who had to do what was called a washout. So they would have to spend up to three weeks in you know, countries that weren't banned. So they would go onto this group and say, OK, I'm going to Thailand. What are the entry requirements there? What a hotel should I look for? And, you know, these sorts of things, that's what it sort of evolved into. And that was all because there was no official source on that kind of information about flight bans, um, hotels. Can you tell us more about that? Well, it was more that people were collating this information from official sources. So the government would announce every day which flights were banned. But there wasn't, as far as I know, a document that had all of the flight bans. So someone took it upon themselves to create a spreadsheet based on government information being released daily of which flights were banned until when. There was a government website on the designated quarantine hotel groups, but this group went a step further and did reviews on those hotels. So it really was people taking up upon themselves to share information, to gather information, to collate information using their own time, their own resources, in order to better inform the public. And I think that's what made this group quite special, because it was really the community coming together to help each other out at a time of great uncertainty. And when people's lives were being disrupted, especially if they had to travel. 
And it also became a very important source for journalists because there were all these stories about what went wrong inside the quarantine hotels. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we as journalists would go on this group just to see what people were posting, what their experiences were. It was a way when people were, you can imagine, someone's trapped in their hotel, maybe something goes wrong. You know, it was a way for them to kind of seek help bring attention to issues. For example, there was a person who was found on the floor of their room having had a seizure. They were found under routine testing when people have to do PCR tests when they're in quarantine. And they were found on the floor, unconscious, having suffered a seizure. Luckily, they were taken to hospital. They survived. They were actually okay. But you can imagine how harrowing that must be. It also highlighted rules that some people didn't even know existed. For example, a mother posted on the group about her son who is autistic. She had sought a exemption to have home quarantine rather than hotel quarantine because her son has autism. Being confined to kind of smaller and unfamiliar space like a hotel room would be very distressing and potentially he could hurt himself. But the Hong Kong rule was you can only apply for an exemption when you landed in Hong Kong. And so for them, that was difficult because the reason why they were applying for an exemption was to not go to hotel quarantine, but they could only do that after they arrived in, in Hong Kong and were told to go to ho hotel quarantine to wait for the you know, ruling of whether they could get the exemption. So the father and the son stayed in the airport for several hours trying to get an answer. Eventually, they did go to the hotel and then they did get the exemption the next morning. The, the health officials said that they did not accept pre-arrival applications because of the volatile coronavirus situation. So that was their reason for that. But this group highlighted the plight of this family and us as journalists were able to highlight these rules and how they affected people, especially, you know, people with disabilities, which wasn't widely reported. Laura, can I ask how often do you see issues being raised within the Facebook group became questions by journalists in the daily press conferences with the government officials? People highlighted different rules and how they affected them. And You know, obviously, there was a lot of discussion and criticism of these rules because people saw the impact of them in real life, in real time. One of the impacts of these rules, which did have a you know very human impact, was COVID positive mothers being separated from their children, which happened for about you know over two years. I reported on it back in 2020. This exploded again when a mother shared that her COVID positive baby had been separated from her. And, you know, this led to diplomats stepping in. The Australian and the British consulates commented on this case. Eventually, even the leader of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, commented. And um, this was subsequently changed. The group is still going, but it's changed its name now to the Hong Kong Support Group. What kind of things are being posted now? Yeah, so I think they were thinking of closing the group down. But it's still going and it's run by a handful of moderators. People are still posting questions. Um, for example, I saw questions about where they should get PCR tests or rat tests. What are the entry requirements uh, for different countries? With Hong Kong having reopened, someone posted about going across the border, what visas they needed, what was the process like. And I think these sorts of things, people are still turning to it as a source of information. Laura, I guess you'll still be checking the group from time to time and we'll, of course, follow your reports on scmp.com. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Holly. Back in 2007, Jamie Gong started Hong Kong's first full-time comedy club, which is now back in full swing. But he's also responsible for what has become known as one of the greatest Facebook threads in Hong Kong's pandemic history. At the end of July in 2020, he posted a message to the Hong Kong Quarantine Support Group in which he said the following. My 84-year-old mom is returning home from uh, New York City alone to Hong Kong tomorrow landing at 5.40 a.m. Sunday. Her name is Anna Gong and she will be in a wheelchair sitting in the premium section. Is anyone else on that flight? 
please help us take care of her until I pick her up from Asia World Expo, hopefully Sunday afternoon. Thank you very much, as we appreciate it. And a big thank you to those who started this group. You rock. We will all get through these unbelievable times in our lives and be stronger. Jamie, can I ask, what did you hope would happen when you published that Facebook post? And what actually happened next? Well, as we all know, at that time, there was a lot of uncertainty and testing at the Hong Kong airport. And nightmare stories were coming out about how long. So I didn't know how long uh, she would be at the airport. And then I asked my friend who just came back from Los Angeles, what happened? What was the expectations of her landing? Then she was the one that told me about this new group that just started, Hong Kong Quarantine Support Group, that I never heard about. So, okay, let me get on it. checked it out. And people were asking a few questions. So that's when I just, you know what? Got nothing to lose. Never hurts to ask. Let me just post this and see what happens. And the rest is history. <laughs> so... Uh, once I posted it, there was just real-time updates about my mom, people next to her seeing uh, her, spotting her. And I just went to the airport knowing that it will be a long wait. I got there. I think they landed at 6 a.m. supposedly. So I got there around that time. And I was just keeping up with the post in real time. And everyone was with my mom going from one test to another, one room for another, watching her and giving us updates. It was a long ordeal at that time. And she finally got out at like 7.40, almost 8 p.m., literally 14 hours that day. It was a long day. But what was great about the post was that it was just, I think, 600 plus messages, comments, uh, mostly positive. It was like a Korean drama. And humanity still exists because a lot of people were just helping my mom. These are total strangers. Just also watching the posts, finding out updates. When is he going to get out? What's the ending? What, <laughs> when, when? So there's a lot of drama and tension. And I was trying to keep humor into it. If you read the post, doing laps around the Hong Kong airport, keeping myself sane as well. It was the longest I ever spent at the airport. And just writing funny messages, you know, as a comedian, just trying to keep everybody's spirits up. And finally, I knew uh, there had to be a happy ending. So I made sure to keep everything Everybody updated at the end. When I finally saw her, I made sure to videotape, uh, take pictures, and post it up. And everyone was so happy and grateful that it was a great story, great ending. And of course, my family and I were very appreciative of everything. Yeah, it was a lot of joy and happiness unexpectedly from this one post. And it just showed the positive side of something, of course, serious with the COVID situation. But it made sure that there are good people out there that would help strangers out when asked. And 15 hours later, you arrived at the airport to pick up your mom. I didn't arrive. I was there. Oh, yeah, you were there. You were there all there, the time. I was, I, was, I, was, I was there the whole time. My parking uh, uh, fee was, was uh, quite expensive, so, but it was all worth it. I, I, I saw sunrise and sunset in the airport, so it felt like the terminal in the movie. Oh, Jamie, how did you explain to your mom that there was a small army of strangers from the internet looking out for her? <laughs> well, she was wondering why people were looking at her and staring at her and going up to her randomly, random strangers asking how she's doing. She, you know, she's going to be 86 this year. So at that time, she was, what, 84. She still doesn't really understand the internet and the power of it and social media and everything. So she was still to this day, honestly, she didn't, she doesn't really totally comprehend what happened and how people recognized her <laughs> just, just, just from out of the blue. <laughs> so when you posted this message, there were around 27,000 members in the group, and now there are more than 97,000. We're here in Hong yeah. Kong. Can you explain to people overseas the importance of the group and what it did for people trying to navigate the changing rules on testing and quarantine at a time? Well, first of all, you have to give big thanks Appreciation and kudos to the founders, uh, Kunj Gandhi, especially, and Tess uh, Leons, and all her uh, assistants. But it's really Kunj Gandhi that went through lots of stress and everything, because uh, there were a lot of questions about coming into Hong Kong. I'm sure the world outside of Hong Kong, you just hearing from the news, you heard of uh, all the changes, good and bad, about the rules, regulations coming to Hong Kong. Quarantine, seven days, 21 days, 14 days, what was allowed, what was not allowed, 
what kind of testing you needed, all these requirements. It was so confusing. And it, it, it basically changed every week, every two weeks. And this group just gave so much help to so many travelers coming into Hong Kong, answered so many questions, calm people down, brought the stress levels of many travelers down, and basically just answered questions to so many people trying to get back into Hong Kong for the last three years. It's been an amazing, amazing support group, and I'm just happy I found it. And Jamie, you run a comedy club here in Hong Kong. What's your sense of the mood now that the borders are open? Well, there's good signs. Uh, there are definitely signs of normalcy coming. People are coming to Hong Kong. It's good that they're, they're allowing tourism and good that we're leaving much easier coming in and going out. Uh, now that you can go to Macau freely, no testing, coming into Hong Kong, no testing. So, But I think it's going to take some time. The last four years, not only COVID, but we all know the protests of 2019. But now that things are opening up, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, looking at the numbers, lots of expats, including my neighbors, lots of friends have left Hong Kong and never coming back because they did not see the end of all the restrictions of Hong Kong. But I think we all have to agree that we need to move on, move on with life, and hopefully things will get back to normal soon. But I think as far as Hong Kong is concerned, it's going to take a few years, in my opinion. Thank you very much, Jamie, and say hi to your mom. I will, I will. So thank you very much. Well, here's something you probably won't hear on any podcast this week. I'm going to tell you a positive story about Twitter. For most of the past three years, many of us in Hong Kong have been reading the daily posts made by a person identified only by the username TripAhead. All we knew about this user was that he liked Hawaiian shirts and he wasn't Chinese. In March last year, he finally revealed himself, an Australian called Aaron Bush. Aaron, I was scrolling through your Twitter feed back in early 2020. and noticed that in January and February, you're most likely doing what many other people were doing at the time, tweeting about panic buying, you know, of toilet paper, finding out what the pandemic was all about. But at some point, you deviated from that road. And in March 2020, you started tweeting about the actual COVID numbers in Hong Kong. You know, the number of cases, deaths, the number of people who had been discharged and so on. Why did you start tweeting about such information? Back at Christmas 2019, I went back to Australia for the first time in eight years. And while I was there, the news started picking up about this new virus coming out of China. And I was like, oh, I live close to there. I'm going to start monitoring it. So just for my own personal benefit, I started a spreadsheet and I was counting the China numbers. And then obviously from January 23, 2020, the first numbers started in Hong Kong And so I added them to my spreadsheet. And I was watching all the government press conferences just for my own personal benefit. And at one point I went, well, if I'm watching these press conferences, I might as well put it up on social media somewhere. I didn't want to use my personal Facebook account. I didn't have an Instagram account. And Twitter tended to be a more immediate news source. So you could put it, put a thread, it would be there. People would see it immediately. So I just started. I had like 300 followers then and most of them were bots But I started tweeting out the numbers and then somebody would ask me, oh, oh, where are you getting this information from? I'm like, okay, I'm doing this. And I also found that it was really difficult to get immediate English language news. So there was online Chinese media and I was accessing that, translating it into English. And people just kept asking me questions. So it started to snowball from then. And you're not just a one-man show, right? It's kind of like a team effort. There is uh, Zhou Chan, who supports you with vaccination statistics and testing information. Can you tell us more about that? Well, it just became a community. And everybody was following me and giving me bits of information I didn't know as well. And at the time, it was a one-man show. It was just me there doing it all day. And it wasn't formulated like it is now with the same stats every day at the same time pinned and people could access it. I was just putting up what I knew at the time. And as the years went on, I met more people. I Twitter DM and I would chat and then we'd catch up on WhatsApp and talk. And it got to the point like Joel, invaluable. And I mean, he's a genius. I mean, you have to put, he's a numbers man. So 
he helped me out with a whole lot of stuff. And there's other people too, people that have written scripts for my spreadsheet because that was taking me an hour to hand type up each night as the list got longer of buildings that were under compulsory testing notices. Somebody said, I can write a little JavaScript for that and it'll pop up and it'll show you on a map and all that. So that's just sort of the community, how it became about. It just sort of built itself. The government presses were mostly held in Cantonese. How did you deal with the language barrier? And have you ever thought about being able to join the presses in person? Well, they do the press conferences in dual language anyway. So I'm listening to the English feed. Other people are listening to the Cantonese. I mean, I ended up with a whole group of people, journalists and others, that were all watching the 4.30 press conference and helping me out. So some people were listening in Cantonese. I was listening in English. So... That made it incredibly easy. And also, because I knew so many people going to the press conferences, I could get questions asked. Like, oh, do you think you could uh, talk to Dr. Chuang about uh, this thing or what, what the CT value cutoff is? So um, it was always handy. I, and did I ever want to go to one? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I'd probably embarrass myself and never be invited again. So I was quite happy to sit at home and watch them in my bedroom, lying on my bed with my laptop in front of me, just typing out the press conferences. That's more my speed. Yeah, and the number of people that are following you on Twitter has increased to more than 30,000 people now, and you've become the go-to source for COVID information for many journalists as well in Hong Kong. After three years of watching presses and tweeting, Why do you keep doing this and what gets you up every morning to do all these? I'm a stay-at-home dad and my children are getting a bit older now. They're now both in their teens. I had spare time on my hands. I was getting them off to school and then I would be reading the news all day. Other people have got to go to work. Or I was just sitting there on my laptop all day, scrolling through the 20 tabs I have open every day on Chrome. So... I'm probably a little uh, OCD on it, but I like to do it every single day. I've been doing it every day for 1,100 days in a row. Even when I went on holidays in August and Joel helped out, he'd watch the press conferences. I was actually still sneakily in Malaysia watching the press conferences at 4.30. He was just typing the numbers up for me and then I would tweet them out. Uh, it's just become a habit, I guess. And there was times in 2021, perhaps, I'd slept in till midday. And I was getting WhatsApp messages from people saying, are you okay? Are you still alive? And I'm like, yeah, I'm having a sleep in. But uh, it's just sort of like that. And I'm happy to do it. I mean, it doesn't pay. Some people have donated some money, but I'm happy to do it every day. And obviously, as we're slowly, the COVID restrictions are getting less and less. I'm doing a certain other news stuff in Hong Kong. So not just focusing on COVID, but it's always been my main task. And you're spending hours doing all of this. Have you ever felt burnt out or felt that you needed to take a break? I guess probably in the middle of 2022 when the fifth wave, I was working 14 hours a day. There was press conferences at 11 a.m. So maybe I woke up at 10 a.m., had a coffee, started with the daily press conferences, then the 4.30 press conferences, and I was going to bed at 3 or 4 a.m. It was just a huge long day of 14, 16 hour days. And yeah, I was exhausted, but I'm sort of that mentality that it didn't bother me. It was fine. Other things sort of got shuffled out of the way. The kids, they come home from school and like, Dad, is there a press conference on? Do I have to be quiet? And I'm like, yeah, there's one at 4.30. Okay, you just go in your room and I'll see you after that. How would you describe the work that you do and what would you call yourself? Um, social media journalist. I, that's what I, in my head, sort of describe myself as. Because that's what I do. I'm not only just tweeting I'm also scouring the news online and then putting it back out for people. So social media journalist seems to be the, the best title, I guess. And you take this role very seriously, don't you? Because I don't see a lot of typos on your tweets and you include graphs and charts to make it easier to visualize the data. If you're a media company, we would say that you have a house style, right? But you're one guy in a house. Is there a specific standard that you measure yourself against? I hate typos. I genuinely loathe typos. If I write a tweet that has a typo in it, it will be deleted, rewritten and retweeted out. And I really struggle with uh, spelling. <laughs> I, I make so many typos. So I read it. I make sure that there's no little red lines underneath it from Chrome to say that I've misspelled something. And then I tweet it out. But also with the formula, I just, I've always tried to keep it as simple as possible, especially the press releases that come out from the government are incredibly wordy. They are really difficult to decipher, even if in Chinese and in English. So I try to take that information and make it, A, fit into 280 characters, and B, make as much sense as possible so people can just easily understand what the next set of rules are. 
And Hong Kong is a city where journalists are criticized for picking quarrels with the government. You've been reporting on all these presses and announcements for three years now, and you've been walking this balance. You're critical and express your frustrations, but you also don't rant to lose your temper. How do you find your voice in the media landscape? Hong Kong is tough. Let's be honest. We all know that. Hong Kong is tough. I know pretty much where my lane is. I try not to stray outside the lane. And also, my followers are of all different types of people and political persuasion. And they all deserve to get the information whether I agree with their political thought or not. So the idea is just to make sure that the information can go out to everyone without annoying anybody. And how did you feel when the Hong Kong government said it will no longer hold daily press conferences? You know, can you bring us back to that moment? Oh, that was exciting! Like seriously, <laughs> it was one of my favorite days. I did them all. I did like 550 in a row or something um, of those daily press conferences. Plus, Kerry Lam, the former chief executive, was doing six days a week there for a month or two. I covered them all. I was happy to, but I was incredibly. Incredibly glad when they dropped the 4:30 press conferences. The journalists, I'm sure, some of the journalists that went to every single one of those would have been having a party, a nice hot pot that night to celebrate the end of the 4:30 press conference. And your work has been all about bringing information to people. What could the government do to improve its public health messaging? Well, firstly, as we talked earlier, their press releases are—they read like they're written by a bureaucrat, by a civil servant. A civil servant that's ticked off all the boxes, made sure that all the information that needed to go out was there, but that information didn't make sense to the general public, and they've not been very good at that. It's always like the CHP coronavirus website. It started off, and it was about two paragraphs long in March 2020 or something. It ended up being like 27 pages uh, if you put it into a PDF. And they were doing the press conferences, but the press conferences were hosted by CHP doctors. There, there, there wasn't the person that they could go to that could explain things easily. And that's where I pivoted it into: to try to break down the information that was getting given out by the government into bits of information that people could easily understand. And for the last three years, you've helped many Hong Kongers quickly get accurate COVID information. Have you ever had any feedback or you know get contact from the Hong Kong government? Never, not one time. Nobody has ever, ever contacted me from the Hong Kong government. I have this master spreadsheet which I spoke about earlier, and it's now twenty tabs wide and a thousand and ninety-four rows long, and it's just got all the master data of everything that's happened in Hong Kong with COVID. So sometimes, if a journalist comes up to me and says, "Can I get some information from him?" I say, "Sure, I'll have a look." There's my spreadsheet. Get what you need, and off you go. It's public data. It's just that I'm the one that's managed to put it into a sheet. So I'm happy to share it with everybody. But as for the government, they've never asked. I mean, it's their information, so they probably don't need it. Can you take us back to that moment when you just dropped all these fences and you know made yourself known to the public? I was happy being anonymous. It was just Aaron at Trip Ahead. The little photo that I have that becomes synonymous with at Trip Ahead is just a photo of my feet at the Insole Tower. The sign says, you are here. And I thought, well, that's a stupid sign. Um, I know I'm here. Uh, so I put that up. We get to 2022. So it's been two years of doing this anonymously, just Aaron. And Bloomberg approached me and asked if I would be interested in doing a profile piece. And the one thing, as we're here chatting in the podcast, to learn about Aaron at Trip Ahead, he can't say no to people. Even if he doesn't want to do it, he'll still say yes. So... I said yes. And then obviously from Bloomberg, uh, everybody else started asking. I did an article here at SCMP as well. So yeah, it's just sort of once the cat was out of the bag, I'm like, all right, I'll put my surname up there as well because everybody knows it. And people occasionally recognize me. People quite often like send me a DM and go, did I just see you at the airport? I'm like, I'm lying in bed, my friend. Uh, That wasn't me, but I I think there's about five or six times people have gone, I just saw you in Central. I'm like, that's back when I had the man bun. That was the other thing. Everyone knew I had a man bun. So I've shaved that off now. So they yeah, like message me, oh, I just saw you in Central. I just saw you down at the ferry. P-. I'm like, no, it wasn't me. I literally don't leave the house unless I have to. So people occasionally know who I am. I'm not shying away. If people say hello, I'll always say hello. It's fun. 
And Twitter isn't exactly the friendliest place on earth. Have you been harassed or abused on the social media platform? That's the funniest thing. Now, you, we all know that Twitter can be an absolute horrid site, but it's not happened. I don't get people DMing me and ranting and raving at me. I get people that are asking questions a lot, and I help everybody, anybody that sends me a DM, I will answer. And of course, when I was doing 14 hours a day, it was just replying to Twitter DMs with people trying to get back to Hong Kong or figuring out what they need to do for quarantine hotels. And of course, I'm happy to do that, but none of them, not one, has sent me a DM getting angry at me. And it's, that's just incredible. Three years, and I've, I've not had any abuse. You've been tweeting about other Hong Kong news and recently did an online journalism crash course. What's next for you, Aaron? Have you thought about coming back into the industry? I mean, I'm 48 now. I'm a stay-at-home dad. I've still got a kid. At, you know, one's going to university, but the other one's still in school. I've still got that job. That's still my primary job. And I, I like being able to do it myself. Then I, I'm the boss of me. So I started my sub stack last year for the community testing notices. Plus, like you said, I, and it's not just COVID news now. I'll cover the chief executive John Lee press conferences on Tuesday. It's that sort of where the pivot's gone to. And I've made so many friends along the way that it's uh, something I enjoy doing now. And now that Hong Kong has dropped many of these restrictions, what's your sense of Hong Kong's reputation? That's a tough question. Um, three years, we did it our own way. And it wasn't the way that a lot of the rest of the world did it. And a lot of the time, even us here in Hong Kong had no idea what we were doing. There was no real guidance. We've never done a roadmap Singapore style to say we're going to move out. It's just always been we hope to this, that. Now, so I think at that point, there's two things. People packed up and left because they didn't have the information that they wanted. Had they been told, yes, we're going to move forward in November, December of 2022, some of them would have stuck around. Others have stuck around and are happy with it and know that now that we're moving forward, it's going to recover, the businesses will come back. But whether those that left all come back, I don't know. Um, many have found homes in different places. I mean, we're talking expats here as well as uh, anybody from the mainland wanting to move across. And so we can only see what happens in 2023, whether the situation improves for the economy. So 2023 is going to be less about COVID restrictions and more about how Hong Kong rebounds. And until the end of the year, we won't really know. Aaron Bush, otherwise known as Trip Ahead, will see you on Twitter. Thank you for your hard work and your time. Thank you very much. And you can also catch me at, you won't believe this, tripahead.substack.com. Thanks for listening to part two of our short series of how Hong Kong experienced the pandemic. In the next episode, we're going to look at how the past three years changed us, how Hong Kong's attitude to vaccines was a little more complicated than elsewhere. We're also going to take a detailed look at how homeschooling and wearing masks for almost three years has affected children and teenagers in Hong Kong and it's going to create health issues for this generation for many years to come. Don't forget to stay up to date with the latest news and analysis at scmp.com. And of course, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook. My name is Holly Chick. Bye for now. <laughs>